Hey, Paul, I'm excited to tell you that we are launching a Curbsiders Patreon. Have you heard about this? I, I did because I work with you, but tell me more about it. <laughs> All right, Paul. Well, we want to be able to keep offering this great free content. And we're doing things like upgrading our website. We offer transcripts now for episodes, recording new seasons of our mini series, Teach and Addiction Medicine. The Digest is growing its staff. And Paul, now we're on video. People can see us uh, as we're talking right here. It, what a treat for our listeners. That's right. So with Cashlack admitting privileges, they're going to get all episodes ad free that's the whole back catalog plus future episodes and twice monthly there's going to be bonus episodes where me and you recap a show and answer some listener questions so people should sign up today at patreon.com slash curbsiders and uh, you get a whole lot of more of Paul America's PCP <laughs> The Curbsiders Podcast is for entertainment, education, and information purposes only, and the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. Furthermore, the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of the host and should not be interpreted to reflect official policy or position of any entity, aside from possibly cash like moral hospital and affiliate outreach programs, if indeed there are any. In fact, there are none. Pretty much, we are responsible if you screw up. You should always do your own homework and let us know when we're wrong. Here we are, back with the Addiction Medicine crew again. And a very special co-host. Uh, I should introduce myself first. I'm Dr. Matthew Otto here with my great friend, Dr. Paul Nelson Williams, who must be sick of traveling with me at this point. <laughs> it's been three straight weeks. Yeah. Uh, and with us is Dr. Carolyn Chan, who is the, uh, she is the host of our addiction medicine podcast and a, a friend for many years now and an addiction medicine physician herself. Carolyn, welcome back. Really excited to be here. So uh, you and Paul are going to walk us through this. I guess we should probably let Paul tell people what it is that we do on Curbsiders before we get started. So, Paul, do you want to say your piece? Sure. <laughs> Thanks for the chance. We are the Internal Medicine Podcast. We use expert interviews to bring you clinical pearls and practice changing knowledge. And we have 4,000 experts with us right now. Yes. And a lot to get through. So uh, I think we should just get to it. We will introduce all our wonderful experts. Uh, you, well, you can look up their names in the show description, but also we will introduce them as they come on mic. You guys just gave an amazing update of clinical updates in addiction medicine. And I think my first question for you guys is we know that the X waiver, which was required to prescribe buprenorphine, has been eliminated. So I was wondering if folks could talk a little bit more about that and what this means for all the primary care docs listening. All right. Well, thanks for that question, Carolyn. I'm Kenny Morford. I'm a general internist and addiction medicine physician. Um, yeah, and this is exciting news for us. So in December of 2020, Two, um, Congress passed the omnibus bill, and that included something called the MAT Act, which is the Mainstreaming Addiction Treatment Act, um, that announced the uh, immediate elimination of the X waiver for prescribing buprenorphine for the treatment of opioid use disorder. Um, so what that means is that for any practitioner who has a DEA registration that has Schedule Three um, authority, they can now prescribe buprenorphine for OUD. Um, if permitted by state law. So that's an important caveat to this is that there are certain states um, where they still have training requirements. And if those are in place, then that will kind of take precedence over the federal law. Uh, but with that said, some other things that are important about this MAT Act. So anyone with a DEA registration can prescribe BUP. Um, it also means that these other federal requirements are out the window. So that includes discipline restrictions, patient limits. It used to be a 30 uh, patient limit for how many prescriptions of buprenorphine you could write, um, as well as provision of counseling. So that used to be a requirement to prescribe buprenorphine. You no longer have to have counseling services available to prescribe this medication. So, and we were asking you beforehand, we, do we do we have an idea of which states? Is there anywhere we can point people to a list of like a handy list? Like, hey, your state is on this list, so you have to do still do the training. So I have yet to be able to find a list that yeah. just tells me which states these are. And actually, in the um, you know in the guidance we got from the DEA and SAMHSA about this announcement, they said to for registrants to check with their state laws and see what they say. So I, you know, I've Googled this, I just can't find it. And I think part of it has to do with how dynamic the process is of which states may have laws in place that restrict buprenorphine prescribing. 
And I think, Stefan, do you want to comment a bit on your experience? Also, states can handle their decisions by entrusting them to a medical board, which may mm -hmm. not be in law. So it may be wisest if you are an MDA at least, or an ODO to start with the medical board and say, what do we know here? Because those rules will not always be passed by the legislature. I know too, even when the X waiver was in place, we still had so many challenges getting folks to prescribe buprenorphine. What do you sort of foresee or anticipate, you know, in the next five years? Do we think we'll actually see a significant uptake in buprenorphine prescribing? That's a great question. I mean, that is why this act passed. The whole purpose is to get people to treat more opioid use disorder, to relax these restrictions that really were unnecessary and a huge barrier to, to treating people with opioid use disorder. But we don't know right now. I, I think that, you know, there's a lot of stigma around substance use in general. Uh, people are not adequately trained. You know, medical professionals are not adequately trained in how to treat people with, with substance use disorders. So this is something we have to see. And I think it has to be paired with adequate training. Uh, that happens at all levels, you know, at the student level, residency and continuing medical education. And I think it would help, this is Stefan, I think it would help if a number of celebrities came out and said that they had started buprenorphine recently and it was helping them. Because just think about the people who are running to get, um, you know, a glutide, you know, like Ozempic now. <laughs> as soon as everyone's talking about it, people start saying, okay, maybe this is for me. But it sounds like, so the the administrative burden has been reduced somewhat. So we no longer have to have a, a separate number. We the, the patient tracking was a nightmare. I don't know if anyone was doing it particularly well. The counseling thing, I think it made some folks nervous. So that's all great. What From an individual prescriber standpoint, what what is the education requirement going to look like for them? And how might that sort of, I, I guess, what, how so the, the administrative burden being taken care of, now what's the education component going to look like? So that's a great question because it gets to the second part of uh, the omnibus bill. So same thing that was passed, there was actually another part of that bill called the MATE Act. So not the MAT Act, but the MATE Act. Perfect, great. No, no. <laughs> Just to confuse well done, all government. of us, right? Um, and it stands for the Medication Access and Training Expansion Act. I think what's important there is that it's talking, it's pairing both medication access with training, um, which I think a lot of us were happy to see. So there is a new training requirement that the DEA has now put out. Uh, it's a one-time eight-hour training requirement on the treatment of patients with opioid or other substance use disorders. And this is going to be required through basically a box that you check off when you either apply for your initial or renewal of your DEA registration. I just did mine last week. Super easy. I just checked it off. But it, in my case, it was true. I have been doing the work, but I think... Uh, I don't you have some concerns about this being a one time thing? I do. You know, I think that oh, it's great that we now have a training requirement that's broader than just buprenorphine prescribing for opioid use disorder. This is for all substance use disorders. Uh, just to get into, you know, before I get into my concerns about it, to kind of clarify what is this requirement? Well, it's cumulative. So it means you need to have a total of eight hours which can include past trainings that people have done. So if someone's been X waivered, um, you know, they went through the DA X waiver training in the past, that counts. You can click that box. Um, similarly, if you're board certified in addiction medicine or addiction psychiatry, you've satisfied the requirement. Um, any other, you know, accredited trainings on substance use disorders will count towards this training requirement. Does this include your podcast, Curbsiders Addiction Medicine? In fact, it does. <laughs> um, Shameless plug. Yeah. But check it out, everybody. Also, the addiction episodes for Curbsiders Internal Medicine will count towards this as well. Uh, with that said, oh, and there, there, you know, one other way to satisfy the requirement is that if you've graduated from an accredited medical, dental, uh, advanced practice nursing or PA school in the U.S. in the past five years that has an eight hour curriculum on substance use disorders, uh, then those graduates will also be able to satisfy the requirement. Mm -hmm. But to this question about is this, uh, you know, is this a satisfactory requirement? I think it's a start. But importantly, once you check off this box, it's never going to show up again on any of your subsequent DEA registration renewals. And I, I'm concerned about that because I think that we've seen so many changes uh, with the drug landscape, with the field of addiction medicine, our available treatments, how we start buprenorphine, how we respond to fentanyl. Now we have xylazine, which I think we're going to talk about a bit, bit later. Uh, 
those have all happened in the past few years. And we're saying that if we do this one-time training, then you are kind of good for, for life. It just seems inadequate. So I would love to see something that incorporates, you know, not, not trying to put more barriers on what we have to do to get a DEA license, but at least have more check-ins or somehow ensure that people are up to date on how to treat people with substance use disorders. All right. So one more one more point we wanted to ask you about, I think, uh, Carolyn, what's what's the last we have one last thing in this section on policy. Oh, yeah. There's the baby. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there is a baby in the background. Um, hot off hot off the press that the baby is very excited about is that <laughs> naloxone and now goes over the counter. So I was wondering if you could talk us through a little bit more about the implications of this. When are we going to start to actually see this hit the shelves? Will our patients be able to access it? Yeah. So I think that this is exciting news. Um, pretty recent. So March 29th, 2023, the FDA approved the first naloxone product for use without a prescription. Um, and they did this to help reduce over opioid overdose deaths. So what does this mean? Well, this is specific to the brand name Narcan, that formulation. So it's naloxone hydrochloride, four milligram nasal spray. That's what we're specifically talking about. And the, you know, it's going to require this change in labeling from prescription status to OTC status. And th the anticipated timeline is that this will probably be available in pharmacies in the late summer of 2023. But the manufacturer gets to determine the, you know, the timeline for when it's available and how much it's, it's going to cost. So what are the concerns about this? Well, you know, availability is one of those things where we'd love to see it as soon as possible. It'd be great to have it on the shelves. Uh, but, you know, I think we can wait a, a bit until it comes out. The big concern is the price. We don't know how much it's going to cost. I've heard some numbers floated around like $50 for a Narcan kit. That will be cost prohib prohibitive for a lot of people. Not a fun way to spend $50. No. And who's going to walk into a pharmacy and be like, hey, let me drop 50 bucks on Narcan. <laughs> um, and I think if the point is really to make this more available for people, then then is this the right way to do it? You know, I'm, mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure. Well, actually, I think if it's that expensive, it's not the way to do it. Um, so that is a concern that I know a lot of people in the addiction medicine world have have been voicing. I will point out that during this changeover process from prescription to OTC, you can still prescribe Narcan as that formulation um, and it will be available. But once it is completely changed over to OTC, it will no, be, no longer be available as a prescription medication. So you can only purchase it you know, right. from a pharmacy based on that price that's set. Is there is this the like most preferred the nasal for it's nasal four milligram? That's the most preferred formulation for for overdose? Yes. Um, and I think that there's benefits to that. So one is that if someone only needs the four milligrams and they respond, great. There's no need to give them more naloxone that can precipitate withdrawal and be very uncomfortable for somebody, which can lead to disengagement from you know subsequent medical care. So we don't want to push people away and make them not want to have medical interventions. Uh, so that's, I think having two four milligram devices is beneficial. There is an eight milligram device that's out there, also a nasal spray. And I think that there's a three milligram that's soon to come out. Well, Paul, this provides us a nice transition, right? Because we're talking about overdose. And our, our next our next topic is overdose considerations. Sure, Am I sure. jumping the gun here? Did <laughs> no, you have more questions to no, ask? No, I think I, I was just being just thinking, hopefully market forces would actually drive the cost down. I feel like th this is an unusual over the counter medication in that if people have access to it, it would keep them from dying, which is not true of like, you know, intranasal fluticasone, say. So I, I wonder if that wouldn't have some impact on costs, but I might be being overly optimistic. I do hope that this means, though, that more community organizations will purchase it and carry it, right? I think that every single store should have it in their store. I think every school should have multiple vials, you know, or, you know, nasal sprays everywhere. So I do think in terms of hopefully disseminating it, uh, maybe not directly to, unfortunately, the patients who need it most, but having it more available just broadly. I'm I'm hoping and I'm optimistic, hopefully, that we will see more people start to carry it in case of emergencies. Terrific point. But yes, to, to overdose, Matt. So, Stefan Kertes, am I, am I saying your last name right? I tend Close to say Kertes. Kertes. I've used a lot of pronunciations in my okay, life. Okay. Uh, 
ha- uh, tell introduce yourself, pronounce your name correctly. Sure. And uh, plug <laughs> plug your own podcast. Yeah, sure. I'm Stefan Kiertes from University of Alabama at Birmingham, here at School of Medicine. Actually, I'm a co-podcaster with Dr. Saul Wiener called, and a show called On Becoming a Healer, which really focuses on uh, the, the deficiencies in how we relate to patients, but usually through a topical lens, such as judgmentalism, uh, genetic testing, mistreatment of medical trainees, but it, all of it is based on trying to correct the way in which we form relationships to be more helpful to the patients and rewarding to us as clinicians. Yeah. And his book, also fantastic, a uh, book of the same name. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, Carolyn or Paul, where are we, where are we starting here? Let's, let's, you, you teased Trank, which is not a sentence I should probably say. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but we, we mentioned Trank or Xylazine um, already earlier in this episode. So why don't, we, why don't we start there and talk about sort of broad trends that we've seen in terms of the impact on Xylazine and, and opioid overdoses? Yeah, so... Over the last few years, in some communities, but now an increasing number of them, there's been a rise in the percentage of opioid overdoses where uh, in those people who die, uh, a veterinary uh, sedative is also found, and that is xylazine. Xylazine is a centrally acting alpha-2 agonist. So I guess we could say it's like a super powerful clonidine. Would that be correct? I bet it has, it is used in veterinary medicine. That's what it's approved for. The paper that we reviewed actually looked at both sort of uh, local history of people's understandings of how uh, xylazine emerged in the drug market, specifically in Philadelphia. And then it looked at 25 communities around the country to see what percentage of overdose deaths included xylazine. As a local matter, it looks like xylazine probably got its biggest move forward in Puerto Rico and then moved into some East Coast cities, including Philadelphia. And folks working on the streets there over time, speaking to harm reduction activists, patients, uh, cops were saying, you know, there's this new drug where it doesn't reverse as easily if you give naloxone. Sometimes a person has it mixed with fentanyl, and that might be called trank dope. <laughs> there are also people who wind up with these, uh, you know, necrotic skin wounds and low blood pressure at the time of their overdose. And so they kind of got an impression. And at the same time, the people who did this paper found that there was a steep rise in the percentage of overdoses in some communities where those deaths actually were included. It from, you know, in my community, I think it had gone from, you know, zero to about five to 10% of overdose deaths between 2019 and 2021. And in other communities, sometimes it was more than 15% also included xylazine. And it's still relatively uncommon, at least as of the time of this publication on the West Coast. But these things did seem to be moving from East to West. Yeah. And we, we talked about this. I don't know, Carolyn, what have you heard about the, why people are doing this? And like, I mean, I feel like that's part of the the question that I don't, I, I've heard different things. I don't know if you have. I have heard different things as well. I think where I practice, it's definitely not as common, you know, I think as what uh, folks are seeing in Philadelphia, but I've heard a variety of things. And in the paper that you guys actually mentioned, um, there's some ethnographic data that people are, were stating that maybe it extended um, the effect of fentanyl. And also there are patients though who absolutely are not looking for this at all. So I think it's it's a mix. There's a lot of heterogeneity in the substances right now. So I think we'll probably see a lot more, unfortunately, in the next year. The local understanding in Philly, at least, was that fentanyl tended to wear off quickly in terms of the euphoric effect that, quote, has short legs. Trank, which had no really euphorogenic effect, seemed to somehow prolong the overall effect. Mm-hmm. But this is being packaged in a package deal that people don't always know what they're getting. Yeah. Yeah, we've anecdotally have heard like the cheaper, the cheaper bags have more uh, trank and the more expensive bags are more fentanyl and the, some of the patients at least tell tell us that they don't they're they're trying to avoid the trank but yeah it's tricky the, the patients that i see i are by and large, patients are receiving medications for opioid use disorders. I recognize that my sample might be different um, than a lot, but I will say that those patients that I talk to fuse xylazine with horror and are like hoping to avoid it, and are, it's not something they're actually actively pursuing. They're sort of scared of the idea of it actually being in whatever the supply is, but that's a very sort of narrow population that I'm talking to. So I work primarily in an opioid treatment program, and there's a primary care clinic embedded in it where I take care of patients, also start methadone for patients. And... I've had a similar experience to Paul. Like most of my patients, when they find out that they may have been exposed to xylazine, don't want don't want it. And I've seen it a lot with these 
skin and soft tissue wounds at injection sites. I mean, I've seen it primarily at injection sites. But the history that we've taken is to ask patients, you know, how long have you been injecting? And sometimes people say like, oh, well, 10 years. And when did you start seeing this? It, this, you know, these wounds only started a couple of years ago. And that's when we started to think what's going on here. The other kind of clinical signal that we got were people um, having overdoses and ending up in the hospital and not responding to naloxone and then being put on these like naloxone infusions for like three days. And it's like, listen, at this point, <laughs> it's not going to reverse <laughs> anything, ship assume, but something else is going on here. And you know, we knew we were missing something. And I think now we figured out what that was. And I know that um, we're all huge proponents of harm reduction, right? So I'm curious with this evolving supply, um, have you developed any patient strategies or things you're counseling individuals on in particular to help sort of minimize the risk of overdose deaths from dialzine? Well, so we recently got our hands on just a sample of these uh, rapid xylazine tests, similar to fentanyl testing strips, but they're xylazine testing strips. We're excited about them, that they exist. In terms of sensitivity, specificity, I don't know how good they are, uh, but they're something that we're kind of looking at as, as a potential tool that we can use to help people detect what's in their drug supply. And then I think the other thing we're doing is just, it's really awareness. It's letting people know that this is out there and it can cause these things like, you know, excessive sedation um, if they're injecting, or now it turns out that I think that other routes of it, administration can be associated with these unique wounds. Um, so just letting people know that, that this is in the drug supply now. Should we, we can omit this from the show if you want. I, I don't think I ever told you, Matt, I in, just received a package. It was like three weeks ago that showed up in the mail, no return address. That was just a kit. It was a harm reduction. It's amazing, by the way. It had xylazine test strips. It had um, clean water. It had condoms. It had band-aids. I was like, I don't know why it came to me, what the point was, but like, it's nice that that's sort of out there in the world in the ether. So that was... Wow. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, maybe someone so, knew your... Yeah, so someone's putting together care packages. I just have to figure out where it came from. So yeah, I can sort of so you can, you can plug uh, whoever's doing that. Maybe they, maybe they somehow found your address. I don't know. So it's possible that that was Next Distro. Uh, which is an online service that provides harm reduction uh, materials to people all over the country. You can go on to the website and you can receive naloxone, uh, safer injection, safer smoking supplies, and they deliver it to you in an unmarked box. So that's a it's a great tool for people who who either kind of want to, you know, they, they don't want to go seek out harm reduction supplies or they're in a state that doesn't allow them to pick it up easily. This might be an option for them. All right. What, what, what do we have next, Carolyn? I think we should talk a little bit about telehealth because um, I have to say I started my addiction medicine fellowship when telehealth started because I started becoming a fellow right in the midst of a pandemic. So I actually I don't know how to fully practice addiction medicine without the use of telehealth. And I know you guys brought up a really interesting study about the role of telehealth management, specifically in patients who have opioid use disorder and how it can sort of help with opioid overdose prevention. Do you mind walking us through their findings? Sure. Yeah. So at the beginning of our horrific pandemic in March of 2020, certain uh, ex you know, rule changes were offered by the DEA to allow the initiation of buprenorphine for care of opioid use disorder and actually to allow other forms of controlled substance prescribing in the context of not being able to see people face to face. I think that at the time it was just understood that we need to continue access to treatment. It likely also allowed more people to consider ways to access treatment when there's nobody nearby who can prescribe buprenorphine. And even we saw the emergence of telehealth companies that might do practice across states. There had been, um, there has been some real uncertainty as to what the rules should be going forward. The DEA is still considering that issue. But in the middle of this, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention people there did some analyses of the overall rates of opioid use disorder treatment and death from overdose in people who had received telehealth services for opioid use disorder and separately people who had received medications for opioid use disorder very often in association with telehealth. And so the CDC took two big giant Medicare databases and created two big cohorts, one which is pre-pandemic and one which is during two years of the pandemic and essentially 
identified everybody who had an opioid use disorder diagnosis and counted up how many got telehealth services, how many got methadone, potentially from a methadone program, which was also allowed to use telehealth, and how many got buprenorphine, which is typically from a regular outpatient doctor for their OUD. And they just computed death rates, both pre-pandemic and then in the other cohort post-pandemic. And what they found is that, you know, overall in the country, death rates went up during the pandemic from all causes, not just COVID. Drug overdose mortality went up. We can have a conversation about why we've had a rise in drug overdose. The percentage of deaths due to overdose in the two cohorts, though, between the pre-pandemic and pandemic wasn't different. And then looking at that pandemic group, they found that receiving telehealth services for opioid use disorder receiving medications from methadone program and receiving buprenorphine were all associated with substantial reductions in the likelihood of death from overdose compared to not receiving those things. And I can tell you that the magnitude of the relative risk reduction in death is pretty similar to what we've seen in all studies of medication for opioid use disorder. So broad strokes, the general inferences looks like telehealth and these medications worked fine during the pandemic when they were mainly by telehealth. This isn't truly a comparative trial, of course, uh, but if you had to make a best guess at this point, we would say that telehealth administered medications for opioid use disorder are as effective as non-telehealth administered medications for opioid use disorder. And that's the main finding of the study. And it's probably gonna weigh into how the DEA formulates its next rules. Can I ask, in terms of how they define telehealth, because I feel like there's a lot of hand wringing about what it's going to look like and whether we have to have a video component and sort of the quality of the telehealth. And I, I will say that some of the telehealth that I did during COVID was, um, it was, it was a phone call mostly and who knows where the patient was, and there were concerns about confidentiality. So I guess I, I, what I'm asking is how do they define telehealth and are there concerns about the quality of the telehealth that's being done if, if this would continue? So in, they, the telehealth definition in this study was a broad range of CPT codes, and I think many of us relied on telephone-only telehealth a good deal of the time, as well as audiovisual telehealth. And the first draft of new rules for the post-pandemic era put forth by the DEA, and I said first draft because they're not final, uh, proposed that, you know, we're going to need to make more of this uh, audiovisual. I think they might still allow initiation by initial telephone if you can document that you couldn't do real-time audiovisual connections. All of that's on hold right now because there's discussion uh, what should be done. No one wants to lose access to a service. I think there's implicit in what you said or what you asked, is there a real loss of quality of care for some reason when it requires when it allows telephone only as opposed to audiovisual? And I think the answer is we really don't know uh, that, I don't think that we know that looking at someone, I think I know as a human being, looking at someone helps me feel more comfortable with what's going on. And I sometimes draw inferences from that, but we don't know if you take 100,000 people who can only do telephone only calls and might have difficulty with audiovisual, would they be better served by all being given training and uh, access to a smartphone or just continuing with telephone for the care of their opioid use disorder? We don't know the answer to that to you because I figured you have something <laughs> really smart to say. <laughs> right, but I will say like, I, and not to monopolize the conversation, I'll put my microphone down after this, but I, like in primary care, we have these sort of older multi-morbid patients where you're just doing a phone call, you're like, this doesn't feel good. But I think a lot of the telehealth for where you're giving medications for opioid use disorder, like those patients are other, otherwise really healthy for the most part and don't have a lot going on. And I, and I agree with you seeing them in the room with me, it feels nice because I'm a social person, as everyone knows. But I also don't know that it I got it gave any different quality of care if it was just a phone call. Um, so I'd be, I'd be curious to see if that gets studied and kind of what the outcomes look like. There's clearly an equity concern here too, because yeah, you, right. as you get to populations that are older, potentially subject to cognitive limitation from prior addiction or prior medical history. You, they may or may not have the smartphone, but they may or may not even know how to operate all of the functions on it. Yeah. And we certainly won't want to exclude those folks from care. And a lot of folks are using their phone cameras. And I have to say, I may get a quarter of a face, <laughs> like just a nose. Hey, can we move this back a little? I invariably with um, opioid use disorder telemedicine get the Blair Witch um, effect. Like the, like patients are just walking around with me. They're smoking a cigarette. I'm like, could you just pretend you respect me for five minutes and just not smoke in front of me? Like, that's all I'm asking. But I'm usually they take me for a walk when the phone camera's used. I once did have a patient who I'd related to for quite a while who told me that they had just 
used cocaine. I caught them on the phone and I actually felt like this was one level disturbing because I was trying to treat cocaine addiction, but at another level really encouraging because I was thinking, okay, they trust me enough to say that that's what they just did. For sure. That's definitely a glass half full (laughs) view of that situation. Okay. So we're, if we go for half hour, I want to make sure we have, we have a lot to get to. So let's, let's keep going through. Uh, what else um, are we moving on to alcohol use disorder? Do we I have think more? We should touch briefly about um, the trajectory of overdose deaths in our adolescent population. Um, so I know we have some new data out on that. Yeah. So we know that from now, according to the CDC and the National Center for Vital Statistics, overdose deaths involving individuals aged 10 to 19 rose by roughly 100% from the first six months of 2019 to the last six months of 2021. Uh, It was actually a curve, meaning it rose and peaked kind of in June of 21 and seemed to go down a little bit by the end of 2021. These overdose deaths are 85% or so illicitly manufactured fentanyls. They are not all related to getting a pill that looks like Percocet from a friend. In fact, that was a minority of the deaths. They were all different formulations, but uh, fentanyls that were in other products that youth accessed, many of whom did not have a known history of opioid use to the people who knew them. The other thing that is kind of tragic about these deaths is that many are 60% happened at home, 67% happened with someone nearby, meaning that there was potentially a real chance to reverse these deaths at the time that they were happening if only somebody was aware and had access to naloxone. So the the idea is that these young people were maybe taking, they thought it was a pill of Xanax or something like that. I know that's a brand name, but uh, that's that's what they would probably. That's a percentage. It seems to be twenty to twenty five percent where there seems to be evidence of some sort of pill that they took. Okay. That may be an undercount because medical examiners don't always yeah. see all pills that were taken. But it looks like that story, which is very much part of what's going on, isn't the full story. That's not the full that story. They're okay. also getting access to other drugs where ch- do not seem to involve. Uh, consuming a pill where they're caught by surprise. And I, the, the pill stories actually made the media yeah. in a very yeah. big way. So I want people to be aware that so, a good number of these deaths, it looks like the majority are still not, I got a pill and then died, but actually something else. Maybe it's maybe they were procuring what they thought was heroin or fentanyl. Maybe they thought it was cocaine. Who knows what they thought it was, but it's not always a pill. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying. Amina. All right. So would you like to introduce yourself? Say where you work if you'd like. You can say cash lack if just if you want to feel cool. Yeah, sure. Um, so uh-huh. um, I'm Jimena Lavander. I'm an assistant professor at Oregon Health and Science University in Portland, Oregon. I do addiction medicine in different clinical settings. Um, I do inpatient addiction consult service, outpatient addiction care, and I also work at a telehealth low barrier buprenorphine clinic. Um, and I also do research. All the things. All the things. Yes. Paul, I think you had some questions about this. We'll introduce the topic first. So you you spoke about a couple of papers on alcohol use disorder treatment in primary care. I think the first one that you referenced was actually talking about screening initially. Um, so I wonder if you would just talk about sort of the broad strokes of that, and then we can sort of ask specific questions. Yeah, sure. So this paper was published um, this past year, and it was looking at alcohol screening during U.S. primary care visits. And the idea is that um, when we ask patients to clinicians or someone in the healthcare setting ask you about your alcohol use, they at pretty high rates say that they were asked about 80%, whether it's NISDA or CDC um, studies. But when we look then at the electronic health record, are clinicians actually using an evidence-based screening tool to ask about alcohol use um, and screen for um, unhealthy alcohol use and alcohol use disorder? Are they using a recommended screening tool and putting it in the EHR? So this paper wanted to look at EHR level data that they abstracted, looking at the individual visits to see which proportion of visits um, the alcohol screening was completed using Audit C, MAST, CAGE, or TACE. And then they wanted to look at which were some factors that would have increased the odds of alcohol screening or alcohol related counseling happening during that visit. So they wanted to see because we may be doing things that aren't being documented in the electronic health record. And if it's not an electronic health record, did it really happen? <laughs> that's a that's a good question. That's an existential question. Um, 
Do you have a favorite uh, alcohol screening question? Like, do you do you believe in the single screening screening questionnaire or something else that you would recommend to the audience use? Yeah, the audit C, which is three questions, is the one that I usually recommend that people mm-hmm. use. Um, and has high um correlation with uh, like being a positive screen that person needs to be further evaluated and provide brief intervention and then screen for alcohol use disorder but i think even the inclusion of cage which i don't think is well validated in the outpatient setting like it seems like even if we grade on the curve only like three percent of patients actually had alcohol screening documented in the ahr which is it seems remarkably low if you had to give us a grade in terms of how we're doing as a whole what would you give us uh, pretty poor, like maybe a D. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and this is Kat. I haven't spoken yet. But um, I just wanted to mention, since you brought up CAGE also, the sensitivity is pretty low because the questions are really geared more toward detecting dependence rather than just you know unhealthy use, for instance. So I don't know that it's necessarily a great screening tool on that level. And I did want to ask you that you'd actually mentioned some of the factors that even I think specifically I, I'd like to hear about the ones that decrease the likelihood of someone being screened. I thought those were actually kind of interesting and also slash alarming. Yeah. So um, they looked at uh, patient and visit characteristics that they were associated with increased odds of having screening with an evidence-based tool in the EHR. And the ones that had a lower um, likelihood were patients coming in with a new problem. So new cough or new rash, which I think I can sort of understand why maybe that person isn't screened for alcohol use disorder during that visit. So that one, that sort of uh, patient reason for visit made sense. Um, The one that was concerning for me was around um, pre and post surgery. So I work um, on our inpatient addiction consult service and have seen um, patients where we get consulted day one and a half to two of admission post-surgery where the patient is now in severe alcohol withdrawal and having you know, pretty poor um, outcomes from that hospitalization because now we're having to try and catch up when if we had appropriately screened and been um, you know, on it from the beginning, we could have potentially avoided that withdrawal from happening. So I think that um, correlation was particularly concerning for me. Right. It's like probably that person had a mica or you know, uh, RCRI score, even if they were like had zero risk factors, but no one asked them if they drank alcohol when that was maybe just as big a danger for them. Um, so it should be one of those things it should be on a checklist uh, that you go through when you're doing your review of systems and the like what comorbidities does this person have that could cause problems after the surgery. It's a good point. I hadn't I mean, I like to think that I know my patients that I'm pre oping but it's a good point to ask about and it. And even clinically, I see much more often that the surgeons will find some very old urine toxicology screen that has one positive substance and they'll be like, surgery canceled. And we'll be like, wait, hold up. But we aren't even doing this basic thing well, it sounds like, in our pre op patients yeah. for screening for alcohol use. We're talking about alcohol use disorder, and we're going to keep talking about it, Paul, but we're going to uh, we're gonna get delve a little bit into the treatment here by talking about hallucinogens which hallucinogens, which I, <laughs> I said right the second time. Uh, all right. So Kat, introduce yourself and tell us about uh, this. We're, we're going to talk about psychedelics, right? Or yes, psilocybin. or hallucinogens. So this was actually a pretty confusing distinction. Um, I'll just say first, I'm Kat Mullen. So I work yes, at thank NYU you. Langone um, in Brooklyn. Um, yeah, so so... The internet has a lot of different opinions about what actually falls into the category of hallucinogens versus psychedelics. Um, But really, hallucinogens is a broad category of compounds that includes both psychedelics and dissociatives. So the classic psychedelics that we think about are things more like psilocybin, LSD, and then the dissociatives, which have a slightly different mechanism of action, include ketamine and PCP. Okay, that is that is more clear. I I did not make that distinction. And we we talked about a study on our hotcakes. I believe Paul, I believe you presented this, right? This was the the psilocybin. Uh, so do you want to talk us uh, through this study a little bit and uh, maybe the um, any limitations that you see, or or if you want to speak to about the implementation of this, maybe. Uh, that would be interesting. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. So the article is called Percentage of Heavy Drinking Days Following Psilocybin-Assisted Psychotherapy Versus Placebo in the Treatment of Adult Patients with Alcohol Use Disorder. Um, and I will say this was the number one addiction article of the year, so it received a lot of media attention. Um, but essentially, the authors included 95 people. Um, they randomized people into either a psilocybin group or the placebo, which they used diphenhydramine. 
Um, and they offered people both therapy sessions and then the study drug. So people got four therapy sessions and then the study drug. I think it's kind of interesting when people, so the day people got it, they had to stay in the room with the therapist for eight hours and they were not allowed to leave. Um, so kind of intense intervention there. And then after study drug, four more sessions, and then study drug, and then four more therapy sessions. So primarily, they looked at percent heavy drinking days and also evaluated percent drinking days overall, as well as number of drinks per day. And they followed people for 32 weeks. Um, and they actually had pretty impressive results in favor of the psilocybin. So for people in the psilocybin arm, the number of heavy drinking days was much lower than the placebo group. Same with the number of drinking days overall and the number of drinks per day. And that was consistent over the study period. And I'll say retention was also quite impressive. Um, you mentioned limitations. So I think a common theme in a lot of the psychedelic research right now is that the the participants were primarily white. And I think that inclusion and access has been a real problem for these and may continue to be. So I think that's a really important um, you know, note as we're talking about how to develop the research from the beginning onward. And then how are we actually going to get this intervention to people when it becomes therapeutic? Um, and it was a small, small study. And everybody who got the study drug knew that they got the study drug. So I think the blinding is really challenging in these studies. Um, yeah. And and there's something with placebo effect there, too. The comment I might make about this, and I would love to hear your thoughts on this, is something that we talked about a little bit before we started recording. I guess my only concern is, like, you mentioned how much excitement there is, and there was so much talk about this, and it made it into the popular media. I just worry a little bit that it might be a distraction from the medications that we already have that can be prescribed by primary care doctors who have great numbers needed to treat for alcohol use disorder, so specifically things like naltrexone and acamprosate, which we know from even the study that we just talked about, are widely underprescribed. So I, I just is any concern that this might be a distraction from the modalities that we already have that work pretty well already? Yeah, completely. I think that's a great point. And we know that the number needed to treat for naltrexone, depending on what you look at, is somewhere between 7 and 13. And then for a campersate, we also have good data and disulfiram probably a little bit lower. Um, and we're not prescribing those frequently enough from primary care settings. So I think it's really important to continue to educate around that. Um, and I would hope that having a new therapy available would not detract from the fact that we're not treating it sufficiently with the tools that we already have. Can I ask for you or Carolyn, uh, as the addiction medicine doctors currently holding microphones, um, the acamprosate, I, I prescribed a lot of naltrexone uh, since I learned to do that on this on this show and with very variable success. But I, I mean, I don't think I've caused harm by it. And some patients have said it helped them. Um, but what about acamprosate? Have you found that useful? And I, it's hard. It's right. It's like either three, one pill three times a day or two pills three times a day if they have kidney disease or not. Uh, most patients that I'm prescribing, it's two pills three times a day. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I actually have a few patients who have done quite well with it, but that pill burden is significant for anyone. Um, the times that I've considered it really are when naltrexone is not an option due to liver function or concurrent opioid use. Um, so then, yeah, there actually is good data for a campersate. Um, I think disulfiram is kind of interesting because the best data is actually in monitored setting. So if somebody, you know, has someone to ensure that they're actually taking the medication or if it's coming from a methadone clinic is an interesting model, for instance. Um, but there the the data is really a little bit lower. And just to add to just sort of in my expert opinion, the pill burden is really high, yet I've also had some patients do pretty well and say, Doc, honestly, I'm I'm taking this twice a day. And I say, well, it's helping and you're taking it twice a day and that's okay. Yeah. So I think being really patient centered and, and using your judgment in, in that context. And again, it's most helpful for people who want to be abstinent. You know, I have a lot of patients who more so want to just decrease their heavy alcohol use than be abstinent per se. And it can't per se the best data is really for folks who are interested in abstinence. Right. I, I think I'll also add that before we start jumping to non FDA approved medication, like medicate, like psilocybin and ketamine, which aren't really approved for many things. Um, there are also other medications that are not FDA approved that do have a lot of evidence of efficacy for alcohol use disorder. So like baclofen, topiramate, gabapentin um, also do have pretty strong evidence for um, both abstinence and reduction in heavy drinking. So I would probably turn towards those mm -hmm. before I turn towards something that there's still not 
sufficient evidence for. You got a bunch of addiction. A quick <laughs> note about a camper state, because I, you know, similar to Kat, I have had some luck with it. It's usually for patients who are concurrently treated with methadone or buprenorphine, so they can't take naltrexone, but they do have alcohol use disorder as well. One, one funny thing I see is that when gabapentin started to be used off-label for alcohol use disorder, people felt really comfortable doing it because I think we just prescribe gabapentin for everything. I mean, it became this kind of catch-all for something that's not an opioid. Uh, and the pill burden of gabapentin is also high and sometimes higher than yeah. acamprosate. But I see this a lot where people say like, oh, well, you know, two pills three times a day is too much. So instead, I'm going to give this person gabapentin. I'm thinking three you're getting three pills three times a day. Uh, so And it's going to give you the side effects of dizziness, weight yeah, gain, edema, ataxia, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Uh, so I, it's just something that I, it, for me, it was helpful because I also, you know, have used gabapentin for this indication, but it was a check for my own bias around it. And I, and now I've. Yeah. So use a campersate before you reach for gabapentin, exactly. unless you have a really good reason. Exactly. I love that point. Thank you. I have much less experience than our experts, but I will say I've, I've heard some anecdotal evidence about helping with um, issues with sleep and insomnia as well, which is very common, especially in the early stages of recovery. So I had success with the camper state in, in those patients as well. And it might also help just to frame where psilocybin actually stands right now, because it's not a legal medication that anyone can just provide in clinic to their patient. Um, so I will say it is a it's federally legal. So it's a schedule one drug. Um, it has been decriminalized in a number of states and cities. And Oregon in 2020 passed a measure legalizing psilocybin for therapeutic use. And actually, just in the past few weeks, Oregon approved the first license in the country for a psilocybin service center. So I think there's not a lot of information about what that's going to look like. I think it's an interesting change, but I think access is going to continue to be a challenge here. Yeah, I'm from the state of Oregon. So we're the state that uh, legalized. And one also caveat is that the psilocybin that was legalized is psilocybin derived from mushrooms. So the psilocybin that's used in a lot of these trials is pharmaceutical grade psilocybin or LSD. Um, so that's one point to keep in mind. And yes, the first clinic opened and if you go to their website, you can see their prices, but one session is in the like $2,000 range. So super affordable for everyone. I, I feel like people are just going to be getting shrooms from their friends. That's what I think this is going to be because it's such a it's such a hot topic in the news. There's like Michael Pollan's book and it, there's no shortage of people talking about this in the media. So I think people are going to take matters into their own hands, um, which hopefully that won't cause a lot of harm. And I think because of that, we also need to remember that there are risks and we need to be able to discuss those with people. And these studies really had very stringent inclusion criteria. So eight hours in a therapist's office. That's right? one of them. Yeah. So <laughs> think about the therapy requirement. Think about how therapy is reimbursed in this country. I mean, that is not going to be cheap in itself. Um, but also nobody who is taking an antidepressant, nobody who's in treatment right now for alcohol use disorder. I mean, this is a really limited cohort. This is not the average person who's coming in seeking treatment. And I will say my comments, I'm not, I am very enthusiastic about the fact that we're having like new medications being tried and everything. I don't mean to like say that I'm totally against all this in case I'm going to get angry emails about this, Paul. I can see it. Anyway. I, mean, I can see it now. Um, yeah. So I, I, I think, uh, um, anyway, I said enough about that. All right, Paul, <laughs> what's, what's next? Move us forward. Let's let's move on to the the ketamine article that you discussed in the presentation. I would love to, as, as we're talking about sort of novel treatments for alcohol use disorder, talk us through what we're doing with ketamine, and then we'll talk about the robots at the end. <laughs> I love the headline you have written there. Uh, all right, we'll save that. Great. Yeah. And I'll just mention first what ketamine actually is, because, again, it's one of those dissociatives. The mechanism of action is a little bit different than it was for psilocybin. Um, so this acts on the glutamate system. So it is an antagonist to the N-methyl-D-aspartate or NMDA receptor. Um, so it's a dissociative anesthetic and it does have some hallucinogenic effects. Um, and we know that, you know, people who are in early treatment for alcohol use disorder have high rates of comorbid depression and ketamine, um, at least as ketamine is approved for depression and ketamine has some antidepressant effects. So that may be one reason that this is a potential treatment. Um, another thing is that it does alter neurogenesis and synaptogenesis in ways that may create this window period for people to be more receptive to therapy um, when they're actually on the study drug. So I think that's kind of an interesting reason that often therapy is incorporated here. 
So um, this was a double-blind, placebo-controlled phase two trial. They included 96 patients with severe AUD, and they randomized them to four conditions. So two of the conditions were given ketamine infusions, and two were given a placebo saline infusion. And then they further broke those two groups down into patients who received psychotherapy or patients who received psychoeducation. And that was a no therapy involvement at all, just strictly information um, while people were getting the study drug. So the primary outcomes here, so they looked at self-reported percentage of days abstinent and confirmed alcohol relapse at six months. Relapse they defined as heavy drinking. So five or more drinks for men in a day, four or more drinks for women in a day. So for the results here, um, so when they looked just at the ketamine group versus the placebo group, um, they did see a higher mean percentage of days abstinent in the ketamine group. So there really was a, was a significant difference there. When they incorporated the therapy versus education aspect, um, there really was not a significantly different um, outcome. But there was a signal. So it seems like the therapy may have fared, the therapy group may have fared a little bit better in terms of percentage days abstinent compared to the psychoeducation group. Um, and they also did not see any difference in relapse. So, so the heavy drinking, there wasn't a difference between, you know, the ketamine or the placebo group or the therapy or the psychoeducation group. And these were all self-reported returns to use? Like, was there any biochemical testing or any sort of confirmation of either abstinence or usage? Um, interestingly, they also had people wearing a bracelet that could um, assess alcohol use. The, the main thing was this timeline follow back that was at the end of the day, somebody would report their use, but they also had these bracelets that were biochemical. Okay, we should check that, but that sounds, <laughs> that sounds pretty cool. Uh, that sounds pretty cool. I'm just curious too, if you could comment a little bit about some of the risks associated with ketamine use, because I do think that um, there are risks associated with it and if you could just discuss that, that would be great. Yeah, I mean, one of the big things they were monitoring was the heart rate and blood pressure. So there are cardiovascular effects. Um, you know, at higher doses, it's dissociative. People can have really negative psychological experiences. Um, again, the cohort here was very um, restrictive. So there was nobody with severe psychiatric illness. There was nobody with severe medical comorbidities. Um, yeah, so how generalizable, again, is this to our populations? And I know, too, I, I, I have not seen this much in my practice, but I've heard from like West Coast colleagues where ketamine is more accessible, that there are patients who probably are developing, you know, ketamine use disorder, where they're just using it a lot to a point where it's really unhealthy and becoming more out of control and a compulsive use, which um, I think is something to be mindful about, too, for some of these therapies. Yeah, and people with the psilocybin and LSD, people develop a tolerance very quickly. So partially for that reason, um, the likelihood of developing a use disorder is probably lower. And that's not the case for ketamine. So I guess the last thing we wanted to talk about, Paul, I think, let, let you set, set this up. Um, yeah. I, I, <laughs> what are you What are you calling this section, Paul? So, yeah, just for the, the listeners, it, you know, our loose outline of things to talk about, I titled this Robots Say to Take Ketamine If You Use Cocaine, which was just shorthand um, to give you a chance to talk about this fascinating study about incorporation of AI with expert opinion and sort of maybe developing sort of novel ways to treat cocaine use disorder specifically. So if you could talk us through this, since AI is going to replace us, it sounds like next year. If you could just <laughs> let me know how that's going to look like for, for addiction medicine, that'd be great. Yeah. So moving along that trajectory. Um, yeah, so the authors of this study used artificial intelligence um, in a prediction model. So they looked at major data, phenome-wide, genome-wide, that's all publicly available. And basically the AI, um, based on all of that, identified 35 drugs that might be candidates that could be repurposed to treat cocaine use disorder. Um, what was interesting is that they also needed the expert panel. So the AI didn't totally replace the humans in this case. Um, but when the when the expert panel looked at the 35 candidates, they identified ketamine as the top ranked candidate to be repurposed to treat cocaine use disorder. Well, we got the robots. We have to listen. I was going to gonna say, so my <laughs> lesson is the robots can't get us without our permission. Is that? Yeah, I think that's an optimistic, um, you know, outtake. Um, and, and the other thing they did after that was to look at 90 million electronic health records. And they found people who had cocaine use disorder and then received ketamine either for anesthesia or for depression. And they propensity matched those people to people who did not receive ketamine. And 
basically the people who received ketamine had higher rates of cocaine use disorder remission compared to the people who were propensity matched who did not receive ketamine. So that was also another kind of big data interesting finding. Matching people through electronic health records is not necessarily really matching, particularly when the thing we're discussing is an outcome in life that depends on decisions people are making about where they are in life, none of which is recorded in the medical records. So we should you know, take it as purely as a signal of something worth studying rather than as the next great wave of addiction treatment. I just want to say to the same point, like our electronic health records aren't research tools. They're used for billing purposes and for clinical documentation. And so when we then try and use them for research, we have to take them with a grain of salt that how where cocaine use disorder is diagnosed or cocaine use documented in electronic health record. Um, but that's what these large language models could be helpful for is trying to parse through these large, massive data sets that are unusable really for humans um, to comprehend, to try and look at trends. So I think it's not like we're not saying we should be treating cocaine use disorder with ketamine. We're saying this is what we should be the next drug that we should study because these large clinical trials are very expensive and we currently have no FDA approved treatments for cocaine use disorder. If you all have time for one last question, we were talking about this topic a little bit beforehand. Um, I wanted to ask if there's, uh, and, and I know this wasn't included in the updates talk, but this is kind of an update, I guess. Uh, we've talked a lot about buprenorphine on our show, on your show, and I was asking you ahead of time, like, is there any common mistake that you're seeing made right now? Carolyn, do you want to start us off and maybe we can poll if other people are thinking the same thing about the, the dose of buprenorphine that is needs to be given? I think that fentanyl has changed the landscape, you know, of the treatment of opioid use disorder just because it is so potent. And um, I'm finding that patients generally need higher doses of buprenorphine, often somewhere between 24 to 32 milligrams to adequately truly manage their, you know, withdrawal and cravings. And of course, there can, there can be restrictions on the maximum dose of buprenorphine depending yeah. on states, insurance companies. Um, I, and I think the package label says 16 milligrams a day, right? Is like the, isn't there even like eight milligrams? Isn't it really like wimpy compared to what we're supposed to be, what we know patients might need? It says like the first day you can give eight milligrams or up to 16 or something yeah, like that. Yeah, totally. It's, the standard inductions, you know, like probably when they first started prescribing me yes. buprenorphine, they were giving this like- This is in the heroin era. Right, they yeah. were giving like four milligrams, right, at the first mm. dose. And now we think that you probably need to, you can still consider a standard induction, but you may also need to consider a high dose induction and, and yeah. consider just giving eight, 16, 24, depending on the t context, um, or sometimes patients opt for a low dose induction. So I think um, we're seeing a lot more in terms of how do we start buprenorphine and there are a fentanyl as well as making sure we're adequately treating patients. Because I think in medicine too, sometimes we have this paradigm, right? That like lowest is best, you know, be on the lowest possible mm -hmm. dose of medication. But I think that we can't really think about that with buprenorphine because oftentimes my patients who um, opt to use buprenorphine more from a harm reduction perspective, they choose the lower doses because it doesn't block fentanyl. You know, they can still use on top. So they're going to say, I'm going to use, you know, 8 to 12. And that's because I just want to use every so often and still function and it'll manage most of my withdrawal while we need much higher doses, honestly, truly to like block some of the euphoric effects of fentanyl. So, so you're finding that most of your patients on buprenorphine maintenance are on 24 to 32 milligrams a day. Yes. Is the, is if the they're predominantly message. using fentanyl. I will say my patients yeah. who are maybe um, just transitioning from oxycodone, you know, those patients yeah. tend to not need 32, you know, milligrams right. of buprenorphine. I'm still seeing those patients probably closer to Yeah. Like, because a bundle of fentanyl has, the at least in Philadelphia, the, the milligrams morphine equivalent is like through the roof if you compare it to anything else. Totally. And, um, any other comments? Is is this similar to what other people are seeing? Uh, yeah, I'm seeing that as well. I've been increasing the doses of buprenorphine for people who use fentanyl. I do have a lot of luck with extended release injectable uh, buprenorphine. I think it's an important option for people and we should be thinking about it. So typically the way that it would work is that if you're You've received at least eight milligrams of sublingual buprenorphine a day for seven days, then you can start the injectable formulation. The first two doses are loading doses of 300 milligrams, and then after that, it's subsequently 100 milligrams, and that's given each month. But in some cases, if patients don't 
feel like they're getting adequate symptom control, meaning their cravings or withdrawal symptoms aren't adequately controlled on the hundred. So we could just keep them on 300. So I want to just put that out there that this is an option for people who have a hard time taking the films or the tablets. This is something that could be useful for them. And in terms of an overdose prevention standpoint, I know that I feel a lot better when one of my patients is receiving injectable buprenorphine, even if they're still using other substances on top of it. You can achieve quite high plasma levels with using the long-acting injectable buprenorphine compared to the sublingual, just because you think about the absorption process, right? There's incomplete absorption sometimes when folks are using the sublingual products. Now, if someone wanted to hear you two talk about uh, this kind of thing for hours and hours, uh, would there be another season of your show? Actually, this is going to come out, I think, the week before your season, the Monday before. So next Monday, I think. Is there a new season of your show so starting? So glad you asked that, Matt, <laughs> because yes, indeed, uh, July 6th, the Curbsiders Curbsiders Addiction Medicine Season 2 is going to kick off, and um, we have some great guests and great co-hosts, such as Kenny and Kat, who are here with us today. And actually, we have an ep episode specifically on that, actually long-acting injectable buprenorphine and some of the advantages and how to dose it, and uh, it's going to be a great season. All right. So so look out for that. Look out for that. Uh, on It will be on our channel, but then you'll have to go over to their channel to get all the all the episodes as they come out. And I wanted to thank all our wonderful guests for being on the show. This has been another episode of The Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. <laughs> <laughs> that was Chris Chu. The yummy from the back. Still hungry for more? Join our Patreon and get all of our episodes ad-free, plus twice-monthly bonus episodes at patreon.com slash curbsiders. You can find our show notes at thecurbsiders.com and sign up for our mailing list while you're there to get our weekly show notes in your inbox. This includes our Curbsiders Digest, recapping the latest practice-changing articles, guidelines, and news in internal medicine. And we're committed to high-value practice-changing knowledge, and we want your feedback. You can find the show on YouTube, Spotify, or Apple Podcasts. You can also email us at askcurbsiders at gmail.com. A reminder that this and most episodes are available for CME through VCU Health at curbsiders.vcuhealth.org. Wanted to give a special thanks to everyone at this table for helping to write and produce this episode and to our whole Curbsiders team. Our technical production is done by Podpaste. Elizabeth Proto runs our social media. Chris the Chu Man Chu is the moderator on our Discord. And uh, Stuart Brigham composed our theme music. And with all that, Paul, until next time, I've been Dr. Matthew Frank Watto. And I've been Dr. Carolyn Chan. And as always, our I mean, Dr. Paul Nelson Williams, thank you and goodbye.